The funniest yeah. thing, though, is the artists that really play these venues take their career really seriously. <laughs> right. and they work their whole life to become a great songwriter. And we go up there and we just write songs on humping people's moms. <laughs> Blink-182, a name known by everyone and their mother, and definitely their father. A name known by many as one of, if not the biggest pop punk band of all time. And why is that? Because Blink-182 are without a doubt the most influential pop punk band of all time. After their breakthrough in 1999, Blink inspired an entire wave of the pop punk genre, with an ungodly amount of similar bands emerging in the early 2000s to start what would go down as the golden age of pop punk. Unsurprisingly, most of these bands have cited Blink as an influence, and even some guy from the New York Times reckons no punk band of the 1990s has been more influential than Blink-182. The band currently consists of bassist and vocalist Mark Hoppus, guitarist and vocalist Tom DeLonge, and drummer Travis Barker. And Mark, Tom and Travis as the Blink-182 Dream Team have created a legacy for themselves as the kings of their genre that doesn't seem like it'll ever be taken away from them as a band. And this is super interesting when you consider that Blink was the band who would get up on stage and make endless dick jokes and even openly admit that they didn't take their music seriously. So how did they become so successful without even really trying? I find a C cup to be very pleasant myself. I'm thinking about getting some. On my dick. Well, Blink was the first band I ever really got into, and it's not just because I really liked their music. Of course, they had catchy songs that I could listen to all day and songs that I related to, but I was also hooked by something else. Does anybody here think we're funny? Okay, three, four. All right. Their presence and their personality as a band. And this is what I think it really boils down to, how Mark, Tom, and Travis were able to use their absolutely fucking wacky personalities to win the hearts of millions of people and eventually change the course of mainstream music. So for a bit of context, Blink started out in 1992 in Southern California, which was very much a time and place of surfing and skating. The youth of Southern California at this time were very much influenced by a certain subculture, in which they would not only surf and skate a lot, but also rebel against authority and simply have fun by being little shits. Uh, I toilet papered some very famous baseball players' houses. We just passed a house where I lost my virginity. My best friend, um, his sister. And what was called skate punk music would reflect that by shifting to a more melodic and high energy genre to what it used to be. It was now characterized by fast tempos, fast drumming, and fast singing, as well as humorous and immature lyrics. So Mark, Tom, and Blink's first drummer Scott started making this kind of music together based on their own experiences in this scene. They would write and play together, and they would start out playing small shows in various places around San Diego. The shows were extremely high energy and humorous, and Tom himself remembers that they made jokes early on in their career that they should be put in jail for. And as you'd expect, this naturally attracted somewhat of an audience of Southern Californian skaters, as well as a local San Diego label that went by the name of Cargo Music. And what came of that was Blink's first two studio albums, Sheshire Cat and Dude Ranch, of which they found you know, moderate success. Sheshire Cat was fairly successful for a first album and got them doing tours outside of California for the first time. Not only around the US, but in Australia as well, and arguably got them more famous in Australia than in the US. And as an Aussie, 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 oi, oi, oi myself, it's pretty easy to see why. I imagine the surf skate scene that Blink emerged from in Southern California would have been pretty similar to what it was looking like here at the time. I'm gonna ask you nicely, if you don't move fuck back, I'm gonna turn off, you can all fuck off and go home, right? And because Blink was becoming so popular down under, other labels back in the US were starting to be all like, Yo, 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 what up, bitch? So another label called MCA got in with Blink to make their next album a joint distribution with Cargo. So Dude Ranch came next and was a lot more successful than Cat because it was the first major Blink album. Bit of a banger album too, not gonna lie. Damn it, of course, is a classic. And both the first two Blink albums have kind of that raw sound to it. Definitely not that polished Blink sound quite yet, but very skate punk, very I want to egg my principal's house sort of thing. And a lot of people loved it. Yeah, my girlfriend. But it wasn't until Enema of the State in 1999 that Blink really took off, selling more than 15 million copies worldwide and soon becoming the biggest punk band in the entire world. And keep in mind who we're talking about, yeah? Can you give me a lesson on that? Sorry. Sorry. Sorry is what you get on your wiener if you don't use protection. What do you 
and according to Tom, Enema was where it all started for them. It was their first hit album where they really found their voice as a band that would ultimately define Blink-182. They kind of shifted away from the more raw skate punk stuff they were doing before and really found that signature pop punk Blink sound, one that Tom describes as nursery rhymes on steroids. And at the time, pop punk was not super common yet. Bands like Green Day and The Offspring had technically already started to spread the genre, but it wasn't until Enema that it really became the mainstream choice of music. Rolling Stone even named Enema the second best pop punk album of all time, right behind Green Day's Dookie. It had the immature blink humour, the youthful themes, the pop, and the punk. Not to mention, the songs on this album were just the epitome of fun. Enema of the State as a whole is just pure fun in an album, with the exception of Adam's song, of course. The content was light-hearted and was about things that young people of the time could relate to, like relationships, parties, and not wanting to grow up, which also fit in perfectly with the teen comedies that were trending at the time, Warm apple pie. and even got them a cameo in the first American Pie movie, although I'm not sure who this is. Who's that guy? And on the surface, there was a simple formula for just about all of the songs on this album. It was catchy pop melodies, fast-paced rock with power chords and breakneck drumming, throw in some whiny vocals and make them be about adolescence, and there you go, you have a Blink-182 song. Blink song. But Animal was the first album to feature Travis as the band's drummer after he replaced Scott, making this the first album with the lineup that most people recognize as Blink-182. And Travis was the one who inspired Mark and Tom to try out some slightly different things, sometimes by creating his own beats and making them keep up with him and craft their work around his. If you listen to the start of Aliens Exist or Mutt, you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. And so Blink now had a new drummer and songwriter who was arguably a better musician than both Mark and Tom, and who also added a certain layer to Blink that was kind of just missing from their previous albums. And something else that was so cool about Blink that was really there from the beginning was that they had two frontmen, two lead singers. Some songs were sung by Mark, others were sung by Tom, and the transition between both was so seamless and so natural even though their voices are so different. And so on Blink you had not only one but two frontmen as well as a kick-ass drummer. And that's dynamic between the three members was something that made their work so unique. The band had the perfect lineup who were able to figure out how to break the mainstream standards of popular music and ultimately make a wildly successful album. So in a way, their simple formula was, you know, simple, but it was kind of genius at the same time. But to me, the most fundamental thing about Enema is that Mark, Tom and Travis had that childish, that youthful energy to them that really came out in this album and just made them so charming to so many people. And I think that's something that made them so likeable and accessible in these times, that they never really seemed like stars or celebrities. A big part of their charisma was that they were just being themselves and that they always just seemed like regular guys who happened to be in a band. You know, I think that Blink has always come from an underdog position. That's how I've always felt. And the music videos for What's My Age Again and All the Small Things especially showcased Blink as the band who weren't afraid to be a bit goofy and make a fool of themselves. And those music videos were huge in growing Blink's audience. For anyone who doesn't know those videos, the one for What's My Age Again is the one where they pull the nudie run through the streets, and All the Small Things is the one where they parody other artists like the Backstreet Boys, Britney Spears, and more. It was also when MTV and music videos in general general were in the golden age, and MTV's music video show TRL had hundreds of thousands of daily viewers tuning in to watch the latest music videos. And as you can imagine, all the teenagers with a childish sense of humour noticed Blink's music videos of them being stupid and dumbasses, which skyrocketed their fanbase practically overnight. Sure they earned a reputation for being a joke band and not real musicians, but let's see what Mark had to say about that. Fuck critics. The only people I care about getting respect from are the kids. Being thought of as a joke band is better than being thought of as an art band or a heavy band. I respect bands that use their music to present a message to better the world, but that's not our role. Our role is to get on stage and have fun. And they continued to show off that fun energy in their live performances, even if the quality of their performances was hit or miss. Tom would sometimes sing like he was being strangled and he would miss notes in his own riffs and make it sound like really shit. 
But it didn't matter because they were clearly just having a blast on stage not giving a fuck. They were the walking, talking embodiment of not taking yourself seriously. In the 2016 Pursuit of Tone documentary, Tom says that to them in these times, it wasn't as much about the music as it was about who they were and how fucked up they were as people. The music was just what got everyone to buy a ticket to come and see them, but the real show was their stupid jokes. And God knows, the Mark, Tom and Travis show was the epitome of this. I'm telling you, the amount of shit that they talk in this thing is fucking phenomenal. I wish I could show a snippet of it here, but I don't think I can, because if I do, the copyright police are gonna get a bit upset with me. But on your own time, if you haven't listened to it, I highly recommend the Mark, Tom and Travis show, not only for the music, but for comedy. It is impeccable. Who likes the Skippy? Who likes the Skippy peanut butter? Things started to get a little different around the time Blink started recording their fourth album, Take Off Your Pants and Jacket. It was where the differences between Mark, Tom and Travis started to come out and started a creative struggle in the band. Because while Mark wanted to replicate what made Enema so successful, but this time make it bigger and better, Tom was thinking more progressively and wanted to go for something heavier and darker, while Travis was starting to lean more towards hip hop and heavy metal. Take Off Your Pants was more or less a compromise between the three of them that made for a subtle departure from Enema. You can hear the difference, but to the average listener, it's nothing drastic or even really noticeable. But this album does seem to mark the point where they started to grow up a little bit. And more importantly, Mark, Tom and Travis for the first time were working against one another on this album, one that Mark describes as the permanent record of a band in transition. And that transition led to Blink's self-titled album in 2003 where they completely altered their sound and pretty much went full-blown emo here. Where are it was a darker and more mature side of Blink where they really started to show their range as a band and grow into genuinely great musicians. The songs were innovative and had completely left behind Blink's original formula. And while the creative struggle continued, they found a way to use that to their advantage by taking their different ideas and styles and using that conflict towards a more experimental sound. And it goes without saying that that was a huge risk for them. Obviously thoughts on this album were pretty mixed at the time. A lot of people weren't sold on it because that feeling of fun Blink was just not there. I cannot sleep, I cannot dream tonight. <laughs> I personally love this album, I think it's a masterpiece, and to me it makes sense because the tension in the band at the time was at its peak, so it's natural that the tone isn't exactly what you'd call, you know, happy. I also have to mention that that two lead singer voice thing that I mentioned before works so well here, because you got songs like Feeling This and I Miss You, where you get both voices going back and forth, or even laid on top of each other, and fuck me, they mesh together so perfectly. You've got Tom's whiny, high-pitched voice paired with Mark's lower, more monotone voice, and it just... It's just so good. And then Blink's hiatus slash breakup following self-titled was more or less inevitable when the tension finally came to breaking point. One of the big reasons for this was because Tom had started his side project band Boxcar Racer outside of Blink without Mark. They ask you how you are, you just have to say that you're fine when you're not really fine, but you just can't get into it. But during this time between like 2003 and 2009, a crazy amount of pop punk bands rose to the mainstream to follow in Blink's footsteps, more than anyone could keep up with. I'm just going to name like 10 of them right now. Fallout Boy, All Time Low, Paramore, My Chemical Romance, uh, fucking, what's that one that did My Friends Over You? Um, Newfound Glory, uh, ch uh Yellow Card. Alright, I give up. The point is that anyone who lived through this decade knows that the genre fucking exploded and the 2000s is now known as the golden age of pop punk. That to me is just insane. And after Blink finally regrouped in 2009, they released Neighborhoods a couple years later in 2011. And to, you know, moderate success, because each member at that point had been working on their own side projects outside of Blink. There was Mark and Travis with Plus 44, Travis with his solo album, and Tom's Angels and Airwaves. So obviously things were going to be tricky when that conflict came out once again. But when a fan asked Mark on Reddit back in 2012 if it was awkward or hard to record after all three members had gone in such different directions, Mark responded, Yes, at times, but that's what makes us Blink-182. We're all way different from one another. It's in that tension that we do our best work. A lot of people thought differently though, thinking that the album was just disjointed and didn't make sense. I think it's a pretty good album. It's obviously not their best, but I do think it's got some interesting stuff, and I like that they went in a more alternative direction here. Overall, kind of a weird time in the band though, let's just put it that way. Of course, they were back together and it was a good album, but something just seemed off about this whole era looking back on it. 
It kind of seemed like Tom was very one foot in, one foot out around then and hadn't fully made up his mind about committing to Blink again. Uh. And after Tom left the band once again and was replaced by Matt Skiba, the new Blink then released the albums California and Nine over the coming years without Tom. And they were... okay. Matt did some solid work with Blink and there were a few songs here and there that I liked, but everyone and their mother knew that Blink was just not Blink without Tom. I've got nothing against Matt Skiba and the music he made with Blink was fine music, but ultimately it was just missing that one thing, you know? That, that one thing. Because there is very much a certain feeling of nostalgia associated with the Mark, Tom and Travis Blink that just makes so many people happy. And after Mark's cancer diagnosis in 2021 and his eventual recovery, Shout out to Mark for showing cancer who's boss. A lot of people were hopeful that that would bring Tom back for a Blink reunion. So obviously the 2022 announcement that Tom had rejoined Blink once again blew everyone's minds whenever they finally found what was missing in their lives for so long. The boys back together to continue their legacy and have a blast doing it. And even though they're not in their 20s anymore, there seems to still be a hint of that childish and youthful part of Blink that's probably here to stay. Hi, I'm Mark Hoppus. I play bass and sing. I'm Travis, I play drums. I'm Tom, man, I'm fucking hot as fuck in this thing. And at the end of the day, Blink will always be remembered for the difference they made in the punk scene in the late 90s to early 2000s, because ultimately, that's what their legacy is built on. When the magic of Mark, Tom, and Travis, both as a band and as friends, showed in their studio and live performances, and gave so many people a reason to laugh as well as rock out. And even when their differences came out, they still found a way to evolve their music in a way that each member could still leave their mark on it without ever selling out. It might sound corny, and it kind of is, but to me their success all comes down to them being genuine, relatable guys who weren't afraid to have a bit of fun, and just happened to be doing exactly what punk stands for, and effortlessly at that. To quote Tom for probably the hundredth time in this video, the whole punk rock thing has nothing to do with music. It's about the transformation from being one of the group to an individual. And that right there is the genius of Blink-182. All along it's been about who they are and the emotion of not being quote unquote one of the group while the music has just been a vehicle for that. And eventually, after starting out by not giving a fuck, they mastered their art and became a great band in their own right, not measured by anyone else's standards but theirs. And that to me just makes Mark, Tom and Travis some pretty cool guys who have earned every bit of credit for being the punk legends they are today. I think about times when we were traveling in the van and we'd make up stupid songs or we'd make up jokes and we were so poor back then we couldn't even barely afford gas to get to the next venue but we were having so much fun just playing music and being in a band and watching our dreams come true. I think Mark and Tom will be my friends forever. Fucking friends forever and ever and ever. Yeah.